All right. Great. Well, thank you for having me and bearing with the technical difficulties. Uh, we are um, in the process of fundraising for our capital improvements project at Bluff Lake Nature Center. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, we, um, it, just in case, you don't know where we are. We are on Sand Creek. Uh, we are in Northeast Metro Denver. So we are right next to Central Park. Um, we are also really close to Montbello, um, Northwest Aurora, uh, a lot of different neighborhoods that make use of us, but it's really great to be also on Sand Creek uh, and Sand Creek Regional Greenway too. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide. So our mission is to educate individuals to be engaged, resilient, and curious, conserve a natural area in the city, further equity in outdoor access, and nurture the um, health and well-being of our communities and ecosystems. And we have a vision of a place where people and nature can coexist and thrive, because we see so many times the feeling of nature and people being at odds with each other and trying to protect one from the other. And we have this idea that we can have a place of nature surrounded by development, surrounded by people, and that they can benefit each other uh, in really interesting ways. So we can go to the next slide. So we are an organization that has been around for a fair amount of time. We were built when the airport closed, uh, the old Stapleton Airport closed, and the Sierra Club took the city to court because of the uh, intense uh well, the, the restoration that was needed uh, due to the um, airport's uh, polluting of the surrounding area, especially where the crash zone was, which is where Bluff Lake now sits. And we were mostly, um, we were an outdoor classroom. We were a place that people like recreated for a long time. But then um, from the like over the past five years, we've seen this intense growth. A lot of that has been due to the fact that there's obviously been a lot of development around us, but also during the pandemic, a lot of people found us and discovered us uh, while they were having to shelter in place and needed a, like a respite uh, from the chaos that was ensuing um, in their homes and elsewhere and we were nearby and and a lot of people discovered us who did not know about us and our visitorship went up in a really big way and has continued to stay that way uh in that way we've also managed to increase like our programming so our budget has increased our donors as well the people who have understood the importance of what we offer that's increased and seeing the restoration that we've done has been really great in the documented bird species because we have a lot of birders on site who have really loved uh to document all the different species that we have around so that's been really amazing to see like the effects of the conservation work that we've done and then of course summer camp was a huge program it was always been like a great program but during the pandemic it really uh was a, a, a big saver for a lot of parents because we were managed we managed to really rethink that the way that we did camp it was outside we had smaller groups and we were able to continue and a lot of folks who uh needed an option had us there so we've been uh basically sold out like within a week or so of registration opening uh but we've really sought to increase our scholarships so about one in four of our campers now are on scholarship so we work a lot with our partner organizations to make that happen so that we can have kids outside uh learning about the site and learning about their impact on the site too so you can go to the next slide so right now, if you are familiar with Bluff Lake, you will know some of the challenges that we face. We have no utilities, that means no running water, no power. Uh, there's no on-site staff presence, which uh, becomes a really big issue when we're learning about people using the site, how people are using the site, questions folks have, especially if it's their first time at Bluff Lake, understanding if there's like problems with visitors or just with uh, like the, the site conditions itself. 
there's no indoor space at all. Uh, the parking lot is really close to the the programming that we have. So when kids are dropped off, they're essentially right there. And that is not a great situation. Uh, we learned a lot through our engagement that we'll, we'll go over later that we're not ADA compliant in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, we want to strive to be above just compliant. Uh, but there's like a big problem with access. We have pretty much zero storage and not quite enough parking, though I will say that we've uh, at the increase in parking has been like lower on the list because we want to make sure that people are visiting the site in lots of different ways, uh, which will be part of the bigger conversation when it comes to like accessibility and public transport and how people get like around in the city. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So we engaged a amazing design team, Shape and Superbloom, who um, are, they really work together in cohesion. Uh, Shape has a really great history um, and experience in the, um, the way that they work sustainability like into their into their buildings so it's sustainable on many levels like of course like the kinds of materials that they use but also thinking about uh the way that the that the, the way that the uh, building is going to be used to think about the longevity of it, the way it can have like a tight envelope and utilize the uh, like the, 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 all the different things, elements around it to be able to have like much lower uh, heating and air costs and things like that, but just to be able to smartly use um, the landscape in a way. And then, of course, we have our landscape design team as well. And we brought both of these uh, folks on at the same time because landscape is is really vital. And they've talked a lot about the way that people will be, again, using the site that we can be um, intentional about thinking about where things are going to be planted so that they can be um, they can thrive. And of course, using like native plants that will thrive in those environments. And we also brought on um, an owner's rep at a very early stage. We wanted to make sure that we had folks who really understood what they were doing in this project. We are not experts when it comes to building anything. We haven't really built anything myself and the executive director and, and the rest of our team. That's not where our uh, focus lies. So we brought them on and they've been a really great advocate for us. And they also understand the importance of having like a public serving space and, and what that means for the community. So we can go to the next slide. So this is our campaign committee. You may know some of these folks because a lot of them are in uh, are, are in Central Park. Um, Tanya uh, and um, Luke and Jared, uh, Peter and Lisa. I think everyone except for um, David Smith and Katie, Rob Davis, who live in Park Hill. Um, and then myself and Rachel. Um, I live nearby in Lowry, but not quite uh, in Central Park. But we have a lot of really great board and committee members who are just really uh, involved in the community. And that is something that we wanted to focus on. This, like our, our board and our committee are community focused. They're not, uh, a lot of times you'll see boards who, on organizations who are amazing at uh, being big names and big fundraisers. And while I think our ca capital campaign committee has been amazing in connecting us and, and fundraising, uh, their job is really to be in touch with who we are serving and to represent those folks that we are serving. So you can go to the next slide. So we have a really great opportunity for impact. It's extremely dense around where we are, um, as you probably know, and then you can go next slide. Uh, we have like a, a really strong, uh, diverse community around us. And that's something that we really want to consider when we're thinking about green spaces and the lack of green spaces that a lot of like our BIPOC community don't have readily available, especially where we are. Uh, next slide. And a lot of low income uh, neighborhoods like around us too. Uh, again, like these are neighborhoods that are, are frequently um, not served when it comes to um, accessible green spaces in nature. Uh, the next slide. Of course, uh, the pollution and climate burden is 
pretty dang heavy where we are. And even though we're a small space, it's amazing the amount of research that has been coming out just about these like pocket forests and small green spaces and just like the impact that it makes on the air around us and the quality of air around us. Uh, and we want to really be that replicable model. And we really want to showcase like just how important and vital it is to have a space like this. Uh, and I'm hoping that when this project is finished, we can take this again as a, something that can be done in communities around the world. I mean, we were a very, uh, a very misused site before it became what it is now. So you can go to the next slide. This really showcases the connections that we have at Bluff Lake, whether it's Sand Creek, which is going to the South Platte River, and then of course the epic Rocky Mountain Arsenal uh, just above us. And we are a much smaller space, but that really is important when we're teaching the impact of uh, environmental education on our young people and how they can be stewards of a space that they recognize and that they feel they can have ownership of because it's it's 123 acres. And that is something that is very tangible for a lot of our youth when they're looking and seeing like, okay, the trash is coming here. You know, this is where uh, the stormwater drains are all emptying out. This is where the restoration that happened, um, the, like the, 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 the sowing of seeds over here has become this meadow, or these are like the uh, the beavers that I may see um, on a regular basis uh, and, and, and how we, how like their actions impact a place of nature. So you can go to the next slide. So we are making our way down this list. I guess we've just passed zero, uh, number two. We started um, doing a lot of feasibility and preparation in 2022. We did a huge amount of community engagement in 2023, the early months that I'll go over a little bit more. And now we've started to share some of the uh, plans that have come out of this. And then September, which is now, is when we're going to be asking the community to join us and, and really make this happen. So you can go to the next slide. We thought about all the different kinds of community engagement we need to do, the types of education we need to do with uh, folks who don't know about us or do know about us and don't truly know what we do. So we really broke it down in many ways. And you can go to the next slide. This is a big, big, big list of all the different folks that we have uh, engaged with. And you can see Central Park United Neighbors uh, on there and many other organizations that you might recognize uh, and foundations who have supported us. So this list doesn't cover everyone. We pretty much just ran out of room. <laughs> You <laughs> couldn't add any more, uh, but we hope to do even more community engagement um, now in the public phase too. And um, you can go to the next slide. So this is some examples of the community engagement we did. We did a really great survey that uh, reached a lot of folks, asking them how they use Bluff Lake, um, you know, any issues that they they have, what they like about being outside and being in nature. Uh, then we did, you know, some booths at different places so we could kind of get to the audiences that may not be answering these surveys or coming on site. And we did some empathy interviews too to kind of dig a little deeper uh, into some of the issues and. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll show some of the results. Uh, there was a, a, a big issue when it came to accessibility, um, thinking about the trail conditions, um, and that really impacts the site itself as well. Uh, and then, of course, like having indoor spaces and, and bathrooms, which we all want, um, and, and shade structures along the uh, trails too. So you can go to the next slide. So this is our big big master plan of campus improvements. And this is something that will not all be done in the first phase, but the number one thing, of course, is that building that will be basically where you see the very nice shed that some people think is a building uh, right now and redoing the entire parking lot as well. Uh, the improved ramp and stairs was something that was actually added on to this campaign after we engaged with our community and really listened to their uh, their needs and, and what we were lacking in. We did some really great site surveys with groups who serve people with disabilities, people who are using wheelchair and other mobility devices, and they really showed us like this is what is lacking here. And so knowing that now and getting some living expert feedback, we added that to the campaign, which added 
you know, the cool million on top of uh, the original budget. And luckily, uh, fortunately, we did find a funder um, that has funded part of that. The Colorado Health Foundation actually just came on last week to fund part of that ramp and stairs project so that we are secure now that we're going to do it in this phase, which we're very excited about because there's no point in having a new building and access to nature if you don't have access to nature. So uh, that has um, brought the budget up a little bit, but we have the funding to match. And it was vital to us that we hear what the, our community has to say and answer that. So the updated amphitheater is another aspect that will probably come later. Uh, having a accessible creek overlook right now, it's very difficult to get access to the creek. Um, you know, if you have a, a mobility device or similar, having an outdoor classroom up by the prairie because that area is really interesting and, and not always utilized because it's very sunny. And a west entrance, which we're actually hoping to have done before breaking ground on the main part of this project uh, so that people will have access because we know a lot of folks over on that side of uh, where like Havana is that try to access the site and, and there is no entrance there. Um, people still do access the site and that can be really detrimental to the habitats around there. And we really want to protect those areas. So we've had a plan for actually a while to do a West entrance there. It's, and we have the uh, means to do it. It really just has been being able to get um, the people who are building it, who got uh, waylaid when it came to the pandemic um, and trying to get back on their schedule. And, and especially with all the work that was done on the Sand Creek Trail right around there, um, there was some hoops we had to jump through. So we're hoping that that will be done before we break ground on the building. So we can go to the next slide. So we thought a lot about the different principles that we are going that really shape this project. And as you can see, like a big part of that is protecting like this space. Uh, a lot of people get concerned when we talk about building something on this site, but we really need to have this infrastructure in order to learn about what the site is and what it needs and how we can protect it, especially with the high number of visitors that we get and the all the different kinds of people who use the site for so many different things. So there's a lot of different elements here, um, of course, like making sure that people are able to flow well into the site, be able to like use the right trails, to be able to use the amazing view, uh, to be able to have folks who are driving down MLK who will drive down every day and not know that we're there, maybe attract some attention. And then of course, like the performance of the building, all of this stuff that we can do with like using shading, solar, uh, all of that to increase the energy performance. Uh, the experience that the outdoor rooms that will really blend the outdoors and the indoors together. Um, and then being able to have folks congregating when they get there and knowing where they need to go and having a safe space to meet so that they can use the site or use the programming however they need to. So we can go to the next slide. So this is our concept design. This is the real exciting stuff. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of rain gardens, pollinator gardens. We really wanted to make more use of that space, especially since we will have, we won't be, um, this won't be like a heavily watered garden by any means, but we will at least have the capacity to have some irrigation there. But we want to be really conscious of using the space and using the molding of the space in order to um, best like utilize uh, the rain that we already get um, since we won't be able to capture any of it. So we're trying to guide it to its best uh, places. And as you can see, the accessibility will be hugely improved. Right now, you basically have to go uh, on the road in to get into the, uh, the car park, but we will have much more um, pedestrian and wheelchair and scooter access and all of that good stuff, bike access. But we will have two buildings. We'll have the public wing, which will have our classrooms uh, and our small lobby. And then we'll have our administrative wing so I can have my office there, which I'm very excited about. And of course, our staff will all be able to um, be on site and, and know what's happening. And an outdoor workshop 
for our site team um, who currently right now just kind of work out in the open and that it's very difficult um, to be able to continuously do work, uh, especially with, again, a lot of programming going on. And you can see the uh, universally accessible trail there on the left. So there'll be one tra main trail going down and there'll be this kind of uh, shoots and ladders situation with the steps. And that will give us the ability where the trail, like the current trail is like the ramp going down to completely restore that area, which we're very excited about because that will secure some of the areas on the bluff as well, because we obviously have a lot of issues with erosion with how steep it is. So we're very excited about those aspects. So you can go to the next slide. There's some more really great concept designs. Uh, these were pretty early on. Um, so we're probably gonna have some updated ones that are a bit more fleshed out, especially after Thursday. But you're going to have this amazing entry point and view of the site in the city. It's just really gorgeous. Uh, and it has just really wonderful, um, the way that the, the buildings are tilted towards each other and the way that we are going to be able to really utilize the sun that we get as well as the shade. So we've been, again, really conscious uh, working with the design team, thinking about how we can uh, basically keep a cool building when it's hot and keep a warm building when it's cold. So you can go to the next slide. This just goes a little bit more uh, deeper into the different uh, spaces that we'll be using. We have some classrooms, as you can see, that will be uh, multi-purpose and be able to use um, as one or two spaces. So we definitely have the ability to do some events here and to have some, um, you know, meetings and that kind of thing. There's, it's really going to be a community space, especially when we think of the, the smaller nonprofit organizations that we work with. A lot of them want to be able to have something on site for their meeting and then be able to take some time in nature, uh, you know, stretch their leg legs a little bit. And, and that's really wonderful in a space like this. So you can go to the next slide. So when it came to sustainability, that was obviously something from the get-go. This was actually a very early slide from our design team that really won us over when it came to deciding who we were going to choose. Uh, you know, it comes like to everything from thinking about the materials that we're using. Um, we really focused on the uh, the glazing and the lighting because we have a lot of birds that use this site. And we've tried to be really conscious about how little um, like ambient lighting we have around, how the, like the, the windows itself will be protected from, you know, possible run-ins. Um, we thought a lot about the justice aspect of this. That was a huge part of why we chose this design team. We wanted someone to like who understood the importance of environmental justice, especially in the neighborhood that we are in and the neighbors that we serve, because access to nature is vital where we are. And we need to think about what access means uh, to, 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 to many different people and what that looks like when we have a building and we have the rest of the grounds. Uh, and then, of course, we had... Um, the, the, the carbon elements when we thought about the solar that we're going to be using, like whether it's active and passive um, and the the ventilation as well and, and the ground loop heat source as well, like all of these different elements, which we have like some funding like specifically for especially those elements. Um, but we're going to be like, I think, really stretching um, to find like specific grants because there's a lot that is very specific to this. Um, and it's one of those things that we have to get a little bit further along long in our design uh, concepts so we can actually have like the right numbers, which we're getting now, like we're getting that data back uh, from people who are doing uh, tests on the design that we have so that we can say like, this is how much we're producing, like this is how much we would need and really focus on what that means for the building. And then of course, water being this vital thing for us. Um, of course, minimizing water usage in the building, but also within the plantings that we do as well. We want this to look like a space that is as naturally made as 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 purposeful as possible. We have beautiful parks in Denver. We have the amazing botanic gardens, and that's not who we are. We are a space that we want to showcase the 
natural elements of our environments. Um, and of course, it's a little ironic because this is a person made project, but we want that stuff to thrive with as, as little interference as possible. So thinking again, really about the, the different types of um, different types of plantings that we're going to be doing and thinking carefully about the stormwater runoff. We get a huge amount of stormwater that comes to Bluff Lake. We are a big catchment area, which means that there is very little chance of flooding around us because we catch all of it. <laughs> so we have uh, the, 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 the folks that we're looking at to be our general contractors are people who we want to have had some expertise in there uh, because we do a lot of filtration of all that stormwater. We have a huge amount of it that comes from all of the neighborhoods and it all gets filtered through Bluff Lake, which is if you haven't seen our stormwater catchment system, it's really fascinating because all of the drains come through there, which means we catch a huge amount of trash and a huge amount of other pollutants. And we have the opportunity to have the kids do a lot of really cool water testing there. So they'll do the water testing where all the trash is like kind of snagged. They'll do the water testing um, in the lake and they'll do the water testing in the creek and they'll see just how the filtration, like some of it natural, some of it person-made has been uh, impactful on that until it gets to the creek and then moves along to the plat. So you can go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, there we are. So this, again, was a really early drawing, but we love it because it really seems to capture, uh, especially like in the education field, the simplicity of it, <laughs> the simplicity and, and, and how, uh, how impactful it can be when we just think about the way that we shape things. Uh, obviously, we're going to be all electric. That goes without saying we don't have any utilities on site so there's absolutely no reason for us to bring on gas and we have great funding from um denver's Casser, the their climate um action uh department to be able to do like the research and the funding for that um and then our target is going to be net zero which we're feeling pretty good about and then our stretch is passive house and that is something um that sorry about that um, that is something that has become very popular in Europe, uh, which is really cool to see and to see how it's implemented there, but has also started to become popular um, in our area, a lot with private homes, a lot with folks who are building their own houses. They've really uh, used uh, Passive House a lot, but not as many public facing spaces in Colorado have been. We will likely be the first nature center um, in this region to be able to showcase that if we can get to it. Of course, we have a lot of things that we have to work against. Uh, number one being just like the placement of the building and thinking we're looking out onto the site, which is like a, a, a big goal, but we also want to be able to utilize the placement. So we think about um, the different ways that we use the sun and, and everything like that. But then also thinking about we are a very public space that is going to be utilized by people coming in and out of the building a lot. And of course, thinking about the tight envelope that we want to keep, that can be tricky. So again, we're running tests right now with a consultant to see how far off we are from being able to get that passive house certification um, and what that will mean for us like as we move forward with the building plans. But we're extremely excited about utilizing, especially as you can see um, at the top there, like the different ways that we have, the different means that we have at our disposal, just thinking about the shading that we're using and, and, and the glazing and of course the solar and and the ventilation and of course like the very tight envelope um, that we will be able to utilize in order to get to that goal. So we're really excited because again, we think this could be a very cool educational uh, building just by its existence to be able to say with the relatively low budget that we have, this is possible for people to do. And so if we can do it on our small nonprofit budget, then surely a lot of larger organizations and uh, like privately owned spaces can do it too. And just how impactful it is, not just on the environment and the ecosystem, but also on, on, on the, uh, on the, 
month to month bills that we have. I mean, when we talk about sustainability, it also means sustainability of the organization as well. And what that means to us um, having to pay uh, utility bills every month. So you can go to the next slide. This is our timeline. Again, the really exciting part. Um, we've moved through our concept design. We're getting um, our contractor on board right now. If all of our uh, contract negotiations that happened this week and last week go well, we should have any day now a contract signed. Um, so that means we're getting close to the final construction documents. Permitting has begun, but of course that's a really really long process as everybody tells us um, including the city just reminding us just how long that process is but we've made um, a really good start on it and we feel very confident and then the goal is that we will break ground pretty much this time next year a little earlier probably so uh we have a year to go while we just kind of get all of the plans finalized we also really wanted to be thoughtful about how this will impact our programming if you you know know folks who have kids in camp or if y'all have kids in camp that can be um a bit of a stress knowing that there is going to be a year where that looks very different so we're hoping only to have one year of our summer camp looking uh very very <laughs> different and having a very different scale of it uh, but hopefully you're still doing something but we figured if we break, break ground late summer instead of like you know pushing for an earlier groundbreaking we will have the capacity to be finished by late summer 2025 and then if we have a few months that we have to go over we still have a very strong possibility of being able to have camp in the following summer 2026. So that is how we have laid it out. Of course, our contractor might have a few different uh, ideas in mind, and they've been very helpful in thinking outside the box when it comes to making sure that this space is still serving the community and that we're protecting the different ecosystems and habitats around us, because that is going to be vital in a, in, in a project like this. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Yeah, and this is where we are at right now. So I tried my best to update this. Like I was, I was saying um, right before we started, we had a good amount of commitments that came on in the last week, like literally the last day um, we got, you know, two very large donors confirmed, but we are at um, 4.8 million uh, that is totally committed and secured right now. And that's about 68% of our uh, goal. And then when we have, we have a lot of grants that are out there, a lot of uh, asks that we feel good about that aren't confirmed. When we add that to it, we're at about 81%, which is really fantastic. So coming into this public phase, um, we are at a really good point and looking at the different people that we have um, on this project has been, it's been really fantastic because we have um, a lot of organizations that knowing that their belief in this project um, from the get-go, people like Gates Foundation came on very early. Um, we've had um, Colorado Health Foundation has committed to us, Mortgage Family Foundation, uh, Lark Foundation, uh, a lot of these organizations um, that have expressed their support of this through their financial commitment um, means a lot because they are big names uh, that support much, much larger organizations and their capital projects. So they understand what it means to be successful and impactful uh, in, in this field. So you'll be able to see that, yeah, we're about to launch in the, just a couple of days, the public phase, and that will be that last, that last chunk of community support that will really make this um, a really community owned project. So you can go to the next slide. And this is something a lot of people have not known about, um, which is really interesting because it's 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 such an amazing um it's such an amazing uh uh 
tax credit and it's like I've had still I've had board members who are like I how I didn't even know that this existed so if you are an organization like us who serves um, children in the capacity that we do um, that and has a license because we're a licensed child care organization and getting that license in, in, in Colorado it's a lot um, rightfully so and and we do it every year there's a 50% childcare tax credit for uh, people in Colorado who donate to organizations like ours. And we had this deck, um, this slide made because we really wanted to show how that piles on top of all of the other um, contribution uh, deductions like federal and state and just how impactful that is uh, for a donor who is maybe giving a gift of 10,000 and the true cost ends up just, you know, being like, 3300 which is wild uh so we've had a lot of folks who have considered you know giving multiple year gifts um but we yeah we just really want people to understand that this is something that is available to them um no matter what their contribution is i send i send a, a child care tax credit form to like literally everyone because i was like i just want everyone to know that this exists because it's just so great uh so you can go to the next slide so this is where we are at now with asking folks to be involved. We want people to be able to share what we're doing, to have their voice behind us, especially when it comes to this neighborhood and this community. We really serve our neighbors. We are there for the people that surround the site. Uh, we, even though we will get people coming, you know, from a little further afield from time to time, but the people who are there like every day, every week are the folks like who we are in their backyard. And that is something that we want um, our neighbors to know about the work we do and that how we are here for them. And like, and that we are a nonprofit organization that owns our site. We're not a Denver park. Uh, we're not a city, state, or national park in any capacity. We own this site and, and we do the work to make it possible. And then, of course, inviting people who may be interested in this project to connect with us. There's so many different organizations that we have met through this process, and it has been incredible whether it's organizations that have wanted to do programming with us research like on our site uh you know we have great scholars and research folks from like denver museum of nature and science uh denver science like denver schools of science and technology um the different universities that love to utilize our site because we're so close to so many of their students and we do a lot of course in water, but we do a lot in habitat. Uh, we have so many different cool ways that folks can connect with us to learn and make use of the site uh, and to be able to serve our various audiences in really intentional ways. And then of course, investing, um, that's something that especially, I know a lot of the um, Central Park folks have been really, really great to us in the last few years as we've grown and as people have discovered who we are and what we do. So we really hope that this becomes like a project that people can be like that, that was ours. Like we had ownership and that, and we had, we are stewarding this land for like the next generations, um, especially as, you know, we serve our um, neighbors. So I think the last slide is probably the next one. Yeah. So that is me when I had longer hair and uh, my uh, boss, Rachel Hutchins. Uh, so you will likely see us pottering around site. Uh, I wish we could be there more than we are, but of course, since we don't have our offices there, it's like a more rare occurrence. Uh, but we will be at a lot of events on site. We're looking for opportunities now to be at tabling events and things like that as well in the next few months. A lot of our board and committee members will be doing uh, some of that connection to the community. So please like do reach out to us and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm also happy to, I will share the link to our campaign page where this document also resides um, as it gets updated. So you'll be able to share that as well. I'm gonna take a sip of water.